Good morning. Welcome to Woodland Community Church this morning. There was a pretty significant sports victory yesterday, but I'm not talking about the Bucks. We've heard uh, Pastor tell some soccer stories up here. His team, uh, which Will Scott helps him coach, and I think Jason and Henry and a few others from youth group are on the team. I saw on the internet that they won some kind of championship yesterday. World championship? <laughs> so, way to go, players and coaches. Hey, we're glad you're here. Uh, we do a lot of communicating uh, throughout the week via email, and if you're not uh, hooked up with that communication, we'd love to have your email address on a connection card here, or if there's any way that we can pray for you or get to know you or help you. This, these connection cards are underneath the chairs on the end uh, rows, or they're available at the kiosk in the back in the foyer as well. So, uh, Also in the foyer is uh, the VBX VBS table. And today is the last day because VBS VBX is only a week away. So if you have not registered yet, stop by the table after church and to get the information you need. That will start not this Monday, but next Monday. This Saturday, though, so before we meet again on Sunday, this Saturday uh, is the baptism service out at Forest Springs. So um, just down Rustic Road, that's at 4 p.m. Again, if you're interested in being baptized, talk to the pastors or come and celebrate those that are uh, being baptized that day. Um, Let's see. Also with VBS, VBX, remember the Children's Hunger Fund is the missions project. So uh, remember uh, Jane was up here last week, one quarter equals one meal. So if you see some kids and you want to put them to work, you can remind them. uh, You can just pay them a quarter. Uh, Give them some jobs. uh, Help the kids raise money for the Children's Hunger Fund for VBS uh, coming up. And... uh, I know on the first day of VBS, we are going to talk about God being the creator, and I see our first song would be a good transition for that. He is. He is our creator. He created everything. He created us, And and it only makes sense that we acknowledge that. Let's stand this morning and just lift our voices to God, our creator.
Good morning, Woodland. Oh, wow. It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, I don't know. I just, I just love coming on Sunday mornings because I get to see my spiritual family gathered together. And I don't know, this morning I thought I'd be kind of quirky. But um, could we all as a church body just look around and just say hi to one another and say, hey, good morning. We don't usually do this, but you guys want to do that? I just feel like we should do that this morning. Just... <laughs> Hi, Ben. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but coming in on Sunday mornings and saying hi and being met with a bunch of smiles. You know, I, I missed last Sunday. My family and I were, we were on vacation, and so, you know, we got to go to a different church down in North Carolina. It was a lot warmer, but um, I missed being here, you know, because this is the people that I know, I love, and um, it's just good, good to be, gather here every, every week and just sing praises and, and study God's Word together. So um, before I, I go into our prayer time, I noticed that Brad forgot a very critical announcement that I wanted to announce. But uh, this evening, there is high school youth group. And so we're going to be swimming out at the chutes on James Lake. So a lot of kids enjoy swimming on James Lake. We thought we'd just take up a different beach and swim on the other side of it. Um, so do come out to that. If you've got high schoolers, um, send them out there. It starts at 6.30. You'll go to 8.30. There'll be a bonfire, spike ball, and all sorts of fun yard games as well. So, um, yeah. A few things that we're praying about as a church family. Um, heard this morning that John Heiser is doing better. He's um, on a walker. He's starting to move a little bit more. But we can continue to pray that... Uh, the physical therapy is worked out and that he, he'll have access to that soon um, as he continues to get more mobile. He's figured out on his own, but I think um, having a, a therapist would be very helpful for them right now. Um, we could be praying for um, Danny Lind. He's got chemo, I think, tomorrow, so let's keep them in our prayers. Um, and then we also want to pray for camp. This, this yesterday marked the end of youth camp for the summer. They're done with their senior high, and now they transition into family camp, which is, you know, a different, kind of different rhythm and cycle that they go into. And so this is halfway, we're, we're already halfway done with the summer. Can you believe it? Um, it's a bummer, but there's good things coming in the fall. So it's not all tears. Um, so, but, but I, I'm sure, I, I, my wife and I worked at, at a camp for a summer, and it became made up for a long summer. So let's keep our staff in mind because they just are going, 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 and let's just keep them in, in our prayers as they, as they go into this next stage and finish strong throughout the summer. So uh, let's go to our Father in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are with us no matter what happens. This morning we're going to be talking about different events that happened in the early church. And Lord, you are in the midst of everything that goes on. Lord, from the difficult things to things that bring us great joy, you are there, you're, you're above them, you're superseding them, and you're working through them all. Lord, and so it's sometimes the, the difficult times that really grab our attention, and so we want to pray for those who are going through these difficult times and, and, and are, are seeking your power and your presence. So Lord, we, we lift up John Heiser and just ask that you would restore his body um, help his, his leg to have more and more movement every day. And Lord, just help them as they just go through this season where, where he's really limited. Lord, we do pray that, um, that you would help them figure out the, the physical therapy that he needs and provide, just provide uh, for them during the season. We also want to pray for Dan, Dan Lind and just ask that the chemo go, go well tomorrow. Lord, that you would give him strength. And Lord, um, you are, you are the creator of all things. You've put our bodies together, and we just pray that your power would be at work in Dan's, in Dan's body. Lord, um, heal him if, if that is your will, Lord, and, um, and we would just want you to be glorified no matter what answer you give to this situation. Lord, we also think of the good things like, like camp and all the weeks of youth that they've had. We pray that those weeks that the gospel is shared to so many students, Lord, that you would be at work, that the, 
that the spark that maybe started in the hearts of these students would, would be flamed into fire, Lord, as they go home, as they go back into their communities, Lord, um, that, that what you started at camp and some of these students' lives, Lord, that you would build upon that and that you would bring other people into lives to speak the truth and, and draw them to you more and more as they seek you. Lord, we also want to pray for the staff as they transition to family camp. Give them strength and endurance during these weeks, Lord. Be with the families and the children of these, uh, the staff, Lord, um, and just help them. Stay on fire for you, Lord. Help them to draw and draw upon your strength during these weeks, and we pray for the families that will be coming in. May your word be effective in their hearts, and uh, we just pray that your spirit would just move and, and, and effectively uh, speak the truth and proclaim your excellencies until, until the day that you come close, Lord. That is, that is our desire as a church here. So, Lord, prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us. Humble us um, and, and, and make, make us children who glorify you in word and deed in the meditations of our hearts. May we be a people who love you with, with all of our being. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. A lot of things happening, a lot of events, stuff happens in our life, a lot of things going on, and uh, it's, it's, uh, we're going we're gonna to concentrate on that when we hear from Brian in just a few minutes um, about events and things that happen. And what we want to do in the next couple of minutes here is just provide the backdrop for all the events that happen, and that is God's glory. Uh, we just want to take time in the next few minutes together Focus on God, focus on the simplicity of what it means for a creature created by him to just worship and acknowledge him this morning. So let's stand. Let's let go of this obligation to praise God and just think about him and acknowledge him and just be with him for a few minutes together. This set that we're going to sing in a few minutes is just all glued together. And we're just going to lift our voices. we got big thoughts to think. Let's sing together.
Let's be seated. Well, good morning, Woodland Church family. It's super to be with you today. Like Larry said, we're talking about events today, things that happen. How does God increase and multiply his word, the witness about himself? Well, it's events, through events and things that happen that God does that. We're looking at Acts 11. We're going to go all the way through chapter 12 today. Why don't you go ahead and find that section of Scripture, Book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, chapter 11, verse 27. And as you remember, as we've gone through Acts throughout the summer, the main person in this book is the Spirit of God. We don't often think of him. Uh, as as a, a figure, but indeed he is a person, and, and he is the person who organizes the events of this book. So in chapter 2, as you remember, the Spirit of God baptizes and fills all those who are trusting in Jesus. Jesus has said, you're going to go out and you're going to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria all the way to the end of the earth, but uh, don't try to do that on your own. You wait for somebody. You wait for the Spirit of God. And in chapter 2, the Spirit comes. And then in chapters 1 to 6, these first followers of Jesus are faithful witnesses in Jerusalem. That's what the first six chapters were about, if you missed it. Chapters 6 to 9, these followers of Jesus were faithful witnesses in Judea and Samaria, so that's the region around Jerusalem. And then in chapter 9, God does something special. He takes the main persecutor of the church, a guy named Saul, and boom, he appears to him and he says, Saul, why are you hurting me? I'm going to take you and you're going to be my instrument to take my word to the nations. This was big news for Saul, but he had a radical conversion, maybe the biggest one ever. And in chapter 9, Paul trusts Jesus. And then in chapters 10 and 11, where we've been the last couple of weeks, we have these events. Go back and read it. They're really important. Uh, they're surrounding now the, the person of the apostle Peter. And God makes it clear to Peter and gradually to everybody else that this gospel is not just for people of the Jewish faith, but for everybody. Stated another way, you can come right to Jesus. You don't have to go under the Mosaic Code, the Old Testament law, in order to come to Christ. That law was fulfilled by Jesus. Now we go right to Jesus by faith. And this was big news. Now the way is clear for the gospel to go to all the nations. In chapter 11, we see the groundwork for that. This is where we were last week. We, we see that the, the center of gravity if you want to say it that way, the place where most believers are shifts from Jerusalem, where it's been, up to the Syrian city Antioch, about 300 miles to the north. This is a really big city. It's filled with people from all the nations, and now we have this growing church plant in Antioch, and that's where Barnabas goes. Remember him? He goes up to Antioch, and he says, hey, where is Saul? Let me go get him. And Barnabas goes, and he gets Saul, and they serve together in Antioch. And, and God is just about to send them to the nations. But before he does that, he has a lesson 
for the church. He wants to show them how he intends to increase and multiply his word. The main way he's going to do that is through proclamation, simply saying who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, but God is also going to use events. And that's really what this big, long passage is all about. We've got a bunch of events that take place, and we're going to look at these events and see what kind of events that God uses. So here we go. Acts 11, going to start in verse 27. Settle in. We're going all the way through chapter 12. Events that God uses. Verse 27, chapter 11. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would, there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church." Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, They came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, and from all that the the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, It is an angel, but Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to him with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. 
And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Lord, we thank you for this long passage with so many events here, and we would ask that you'd help us to understand what you would teach us from your word today, and we pray this in your name, amen. Now, before we actually get into this passage and talk about it, can, can I nerd out with you a little bit? By bringing some technical things to light, I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then we'll stop at a certain point. What we have in Luke's account here is a time gap. Luke is a very, very careful and good historian, but he's not a modern historian. He takes liberties with events and he arranges them thematically so that if we're following the timeline of this account, we sometimes have gaps and it helps us to recognize them. So, for example, when we come to the end of last week's passage in chapter 11 where Barnabas goes and gets Saul, and they're ministering together in Antioch. That brings us up to the year AD 36. So it's been about four years since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. By the time we get to chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, which describes the Jerusalem Council, we're in the year AD 48, we, 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 we know that. That's easy. That's a hard date that we can put down, and it's documented by so many other sources. What happened? Where did all those years go? By my reckoning, and I'm, this isn't original to me, but most Bible teachers believe that there is a 10-year gap between verse 26 of chapter 11 and verse 27. And this 10-year gap is followed by a kind of flashback that is the majority of our passage that we're looking at today. So in verse 26, you have, you have Saul and Barnabas in Antioch, and they, they simply serve together for 10 years. Barnabas is probably the leader here. Saul is growing in his responsibility, and they're simply serving together. By the time we get to 27, we jump to the year 46. Now, this is the nerdy part. Why do we think that there's the 10-year gap right here? I've got five reasons. I'm going to go through them really quickly. The first one is that we see in this passage that the Roman emperor Claudius is on the throne, and, and we know from all sorts of other documents that Claudius reigned from 41 to 54. And so that takes us out of the year 36. We're jumping forward in time. Secondly, we have a Ro the, the Roman historian Suetonius says that Claudius' reign um, included four major worldwide famines. In fact, his reign was characterized by famines. So that, that squares with what we're reading in this passage with this troop, trip to Jerusalem because of a famine. Third reason, the Jewish historian Josephus talks about a major famine in Judea that took place in the years 44 to 48. So again, that squares with what we're talking about. Fourthly, the Jerusalem Council, we know that's in the year 48, and so we need to get close to that date. 
for, and the year 46 does that. But the most important reason that we believe the 10-year gap is between verses 26 and 27 is that in Galatians 2, Paul talks about a trip to Jerusalem in response to a vision that also has something to do with the poor, and that trip took place 14 years after his first trip to Jerusalem, which we read about in Acts chapter 9, and it's there where he met the apostle Peter and Pastor James, and he brought Titus with him, and that brings us to the year 46. <sighs> That's the nerdy part. Why is this important? Why, why do we care about going through these verses carefully and actually looking at where these events take place in relationship to one another? One of my concerns as we read through the Bible together is that, that some people, maybe because of, I don't know, where, because of their background and where they come from maybe, they, they, they might tend to think that what we're really looking at here is just religious talk. That these are just good ideas and somebody, I don't know, in the Middle Ages, maybe they made this stuff up and we're better and we're encouraged by reading the Bible, but this isn't actually history. It didn't really take place and the Bible is just kind of out there and it's like sort of this religious fairyland and we could take it or leave it if we want to. We need to realize when we read this that the events in Acts are corroborated by historians outside of Scripture, and they make sense internally as well. In other words, you, you can look at secular sources outside of Scripture, and they talk about the same events. Luke is a very, very careful historian, and this is not just religious talk. In, in fact, Luke is describing real history it's based on one central event, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. Something happened, and that something is that Jesus is alive. He was raised from the dead. It really happened in space and time, and because that something happened, everything else happened, and this is real history, and this is real, really important, and we can base our lives on what we're reading about today. That's the reason that we nerd out every once in a while, because it's really important. Okay, back to the passage. What kind of events does God use? We have five events that take place in this passage, and this idea of multiplying God's word ties all of these events together. The first event we read about is that a church is served. This is at the end of chapter 11. You have Agabus, this prophet. He stands up and proclaims a famine that's going to take place in the whole world. This is by God's grace. This is how God takes care of his people. Remember, this is during apostolic times in the first century. They don't have a New Testament. God works with his people through his spirit at using the Old Testament, the scripture they had, and he also instructs his people through prophets, and Agabus is one of these guys. And so they decide up there in Antioch, the church plant, they decide they're going to help the believers in the original church. This is kind of neat. You have a, an original church that, uh, where the people have been impoverished, maybe they've, because they've been so generous, but they've also been persecuted. Now there's a famine. You have a wealthy church plant up in Antioch, and they're going to help the believers from the original church. And so they give a gift uh, through Barnabas and Saul. And Titus is included here. We'll meet him later. And they go up to south, but up to Jerusalem, and they, give, and they deliver this gift. What kind of event is this? Well, it's a good event. I'm thinking about the, the gift. It's a good thing, but it's a fairly ordinary thing. This is not a miraculous event, all right? An angel didn't say, come and take your gifts and I'll deliver the gifts for you. That would be miraculous. That's not what happened. Here's a church caring for another church. This is the kind of thing we're doing here over VBS with the Children's Hunger Fund where our kids and, of course, the parents behind the kids are gathering up funds because we're helping real children who really are hungry. It's a good thing. 
It's not a miracle. It's just something that we're doing in response to what God has given us and how he's leading us. So that's a kind of event that God uses. Getting into chapter 12, we're going to see that there is another kind of event. This is a terribly sad one. But for the first time, an apostle is actually killed. We haven't, we've lost Stephen. We've lost lots of believers. We haven't lost any apostles yet. But we do here at the beginning of chapter 12. And, and this begins, if we're following the timeline, a kind of flashback. A couple of years earlier, and it involves Herod Agrippa I. He is the grandson of Herod. Herod the Great. Remember Herod when Jesus was born and the Herod who, who killed the babies in Jerusalem and Bethlehem? Uh, terrible stuff. This is his grandson, and he came to power under Emperor Caligula in the year AD 37, and he came to power in Judea in the years 41 to 44 when he died underneath Claudius. We're also told it took place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the feast that includes the Passover in which Jesus died. So I'm placing this event 11 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We also have a little time marker here that says about this time this took place, but don't be confused by that. That time marker can can express an approximation. It doesn't mean that this happened at exactly the same time as the events we've just heard about. Anyway, sorry, I keep doing this. I just keep slipping into this nerd mode because it's so exciting to just look at how, how the needlework of Luke's account takes place. Anyway, Herod wants to please the Jewish leadership. And he figures out that if he persecutes Christians, it's going to help the religious leadership be more secure, and they just kind of want to be in charge, and so Herod can help, them without, can help them out with that, and so they have this kind of perverse relationship. And so Herod arrests the Apostle James. Remember, there are two Jameses. There's Apostle James, as in Peter, James, and John, and then there's Pastor James, who is the brother of our Lord, who trusted Jesus sometime after Jesus' resurrection, became the leader of the Jerusalem church and wrote the book of James. So two Jameses, actually three, but two main ones. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll do better. I, I will. And Herod probably beheads James. He kills him with the sword by means of the sword. He runs him through. Romans like to behead people. That's probably what happened and then Herod sees that he's doing really well, and so he arrests Peter, holds him probably at the fortress Antonio, which is on the southwest side of the Temple Mount, and he guards him with four squads of soldiers. That would be 16 soldiers, four soldiers per squad, and they rotate through every four hours. Do you think you could make it out of that type of arrangement? in a natural way? I don't think so. I think they know what they're doing here in guarding Peter, and they're planning to bring him out and execute him after Passover and kill him. And the people of God respond by praying. What kind of event is this? Well, the first thing was good. This is bad. James is dead. Is it a miraculous event, or is it pretty ordinary? Well, it's a natural event. A tyrant kills somebody. That's not a miracle. That's an ordinary event that God is going to use to multiply his word. And you know what? We have bad ordinary events too. We get bad medical reports, job losses, troubles, troubles in the marriage, rebellious kids, deaths of loved ones, arguments, car accidents, weariness, and you can just make a list of hundreds and hundreds of things. God allows things like that in our lives too in order to increase and multiply his word. God uses all kinds of events. Event number three, an apostle is rescued. Verses 6 to 19 of chapter 12. So Peter is in this prison, and, and we won't go through all the events here, but note how physical 
this description is. Luke likes detail. He's a medical doctor. He describes things in great physical detail. Notice also he tells us Peter is sleeping. I probably wouldn't be sleeping. You probably wouldn't either. Peter is so confident in God that he's like, oh, I'm going to die. I think I'll go to sleep. He can do that, but Luke tells us that. He's chained to two soldiers, and there's two more at the door. Look at the detail here. This angel appears, okay? It's miraculous, but totally normal within God's plan. The angel appears and whacks him. I got a question. How does a non-corporeal being whack somebody? There's actually commentary writings about this. We won't talk about that. That would be nerdy. All right? But the angel somehow kicks him or whacks him and says, hey, wake up, Peter. And he says, put on your sandals, put your cloak on you. Peter probably is like, why? I'm in prison. You know, I'm because you're going outside. And he takes him outside the prison. He passes the other squads of soldiers. The gates open of their own accord. The angel disappears, and Peter is standing outside with his shoes on and his cloak on. And he's like, hey, I'm not in prison anymore. So what's he going to do? Well, he goes to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Mary is probably the owner of the upper room where Jesus met with, with his disciples. They had continued to meet there after that time. Probably. We don't know that. But that's where Peter goes. That's his first instinct. Note the surprise when he gets there. This girl named Rhoda comes to the door. You don't believe this took place? Go ask Rhoda. All right? The, 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 the readers of this knew this girl named Rhoda. She's probably still alive in the Jerusalem church. Go talk to, talk to Rhoda. She'll tell you all about it. She recognizes Peter's voice, and then they jump around, and they're excited. And they say, Rhoda, you're out of your mind. We don't really believe you. And then they finally let Peter in. That's kind of funny. Peter comes in, and he explains everything. He says, go tell Pastor James that all this has taken place. And then we get this section, true to, true to, true to form here, what happened to the soldiers, what we find out. Herod talks to these soldiers. They really don't have a good explanation. They certainly don't have a natural expla explanation or one that the Romans would believe for why Peter is suddenly gone. And then, great, with great irony, Herod has them executed, or at least the Roman authorities have the soldiers executed. What kind of event is this? Peter being sprung out of jail. It's a good event. It's not bad. It's, it's good. It's fantastic. Is it natural? We're given lots of natural detail, but really it is a miraculous event. God uses miraculous events to multiply and increase his word, but not all the time. He didn't save James in a miraculous way, and yet he saved Peter in a miraculous way. He he, he doesn't always do this, but sometimes he does this. He doesn't do this because we want him to. He does it when and if he desires to express himself in a miraculous way. That can happen. We have to allow for that. Serving us in a miraculous way by suspending the laws of nature is something that God can do and we see an event like that in this account. Fourth event, a tyrant is judged. Verse 20 to 23, Herod, this is the same Herod, Herod Agrippa I, he's angry with Tyre and Sidon. Why? We don't really know, but it probably involves shipping and trade. Herod controlled the ports of entry for imports, and he's punishing these cities by sending the imports somewhere else. It's economics, you know, stuff like that. That's what's going on. His chamberlain, a guy named Blastus, wonderful name. Don't name your kid that. Blastus. Name your dog that. Blastus cuts a deal with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and it goes something like this. Herod is really angry with you, and you're going to starve unless you do something to change these events. Here's the deal. I'll set up this thing 
where Herod has a press conference and we'll get the cameras going and we'll get Herod to dress up in his, you know, his robes and stuff and he'll come out and he'll give this little speech that I'll write for him and you just tell him how wonderful he is and make him feel good, build him up so that he feels secure as king and then I'll make a deal, I'll get the imports to go through your ports again. So the whole thing is a charade, but Herod plays along with this. And he dresses in his finest, and he goes out there, and the people say, the voice of a God and not of a man. I mean, this is just, eh. Luke, as he describes this, says, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms. How's that? For a natural, a merger of natural causes and supernatural causes. Interesting, the, the historian Josephus talks about this too. It's not just in the Bible that we read about this event because Herod was a big figure. Josephus writes that Herod did not reject the crowd's impious flattery and he died of a painful stomach condition. All right, Herod does, or Josephus doesn't mention the angel, but which is it? Well, it can be both. It can be natural and supernatural. They're not opposed to one another. And by the way, we always believe Luke over Josephus. But we've got God doing a, a, a natural, a, a supernatural thing here. And it's a bad thing for Herod, good for God's people, and good because God is executing his justice within the events of this passage. He doesn't always do that. Sometimes we'll wait for Christ's return to see justice played out. But right here, God is so into his first followers and seeing the gospel go out that he's like, boom. Here's an obstacle to God's, to my word going out. I'm going to judge this man. And I think we need to recognize as we read this that we don't judge God's people or we don't judge people. God does. We don't remove obstacles to the gospel but if we trust in Jesus to take care of us, sometimes he removes hindrances to the gospel. So we have a different kind of event here as well. Final event, it's simply a job completed. Verses 24 20 to 25, this ends the fourth book, the fourth major section of Luke's account. Uh, we have come full circle here back to the year 46. We started out with... Barnabas and Saul going up to Jerusalem in the year 46. We've had our flashback, and now Luke is going to finish the account by referring to Barnabas and Saul again. They return to Jerusalem, uh, or they return to Antioch, and they have delivered the gift to the persecuted, impoverished church in Jerusalem. They bring John Mark with them. He's going to become important. And, and God's people have learned how God will increase and multiply his word. It's through proclamation, but also through events. And, and God has used all of these events to bring, to, to get out the witness to himself. Good events, bad events, miraculous events, ordinary events that God still ordains. And we see that God increases and multiplied his word through events, both good and bad, both miraculous and ordinary. That's what ties together all of these events, things that happen in this passage. A couple of takeaways and we're done here. First of all, I recognize in myself that I sometimes want to control events. Don't you want to control events? Don't you want to get down in the details of your life and say, I, will, I think if I do this, then this will happen? And I sometimes wear myself out just trying to control events. You know, I want the good medical report. Like, dear Lord, this is what I want the sonogram or the ultrasound or the CAT scan or whatever to reveal. Please deliver this, this report. This is what I want. Or I want this kind of success. Or I want it not to rain for the baptism. That's what I want. I don't have a plan B at the moment. This is what I want. Please deliver this result. Do you know what? God doesn't play that way. If he chooses, he honors the desires of our hearts, but sometimes the medical report is not what we want. And at that point, we just simply have to say, Lord, I'm yours. Please help me. 
this is the event that you have given me. I am trusting you to multiply and increase your word and your witness and and to, to send your gospel forward through my response to this event. And I need to work in my own heart and confess the desire to control events because God works through all kinds of events. Second takeaway, this week there's going to be events. I I guarantee it. I can promise that. Things are going to happen. And I have plans. Um, We finished up soccer last night. That frees up some time. I need to build a gate for, to keep the chickens in. That's just, one, that's just a plan that I have. And I, I hope to meet with some people. I hope to do the baptism. I, I've got plans this week, but I don't know if those plans are going to come to fruition. There are going to be events this week, and they may disrupt my plans. And you know what? You need to remind me when that happens that these are events that God uses. Things that happen, and and God is going to take those things to multiply and increase his word. I need your help to remember that. You probably need my help to remember that. And that's the kind of thing we do when we encourage each other as we respond to events in our lives. Pretty neat, huh? All the stuff that goes along, different kinds of things, bad things, good things, miraculous things, ordinary things, We get to rely on God in the midst of all of this. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this long passage that includes so many details that that give us confidence that this really records what happened. And the big thing that happened, Jesus, is that you're alive. You were raised from the dead You were working in your people through your spirit. You are working in your people through your spirit. You give us events. Some of them we like, some of them we don't. But Lord, they're from you, and you desire to use whatever is to increase the witness about who you are, Jesus. And we're your servants. We need your help. We need to rely on you, and we need to encourage each other to rely on you Would you do that today, Lord, for your name's sake? We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand for our benediction and closing. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's amen together.